Right, I can almost smell another question in the air. I'm coming to you, Simon. Hello, how are you, my love? I'm very well, thank you. Excellent. Now, what is your question? Well, I'm a very keen baker at home. Are there any hints and tips from the professionals on how to get that perfect loaf? Right, well, I'm going to go to Lisa. Um, so, the perfect loaf, where do we start, Lisa? I think it's got to be, for me, all about the ingredients mm. when you start off, but we're using the correct ingredients. So here we've got some strong uh, bread flour, which is high in protein. Yeah. You need that to be able to get the gluten going in your breads. Um, so here what we've got is yeast as well also. So in here we've got the strong bread flour and the yeast. This is a quick activated yeast. So basically with a quick activated yeast, you can just add it to your flour, add your salt, your sugar and your bit of water in there. With other kinds of yeast, such as the fresh yeast, which I particularly use in the restaurant, you can add that straight in um, with your warm water. Yeah. Um, the other one, uh, which comes in a little tin like this, you have to basically activate it before you put it into the so flour. So that's where you use the sort of tepid warm water? And yeah. The thing about yeast is that if your water's too hot, yeah. you're going to kill it to start with. But if it's just lovely and lukewarm, like a blood temperature, then it starts that activation going mm. when you're making it. So what texture should you look for? Uh, you're looking for something that comes together, so it comes away from the bowl and it's quite easy to, to work with. You can see it's all come together nice, nicely there. Yeah. This is where you've got to get tough with it. Um, now, the thing about this stage is, is a lot of people say, how long does it take to knead it and what's it look like? But if you stood there going like this, it's going to take ages. Mm. But if you actually get in there and you stretch your, stretch the gluten oh, and you get it going that. in there, properly that's working. When you do it. You can see where it's tearing now. You see. And that's the gluten stretching. Yeah, so. working that gluten. So when do you stop kneading? At what point? Basically, you want to keep kneading it. Um, and then what will happen is it gets elasticity to it, but doesn't snap. So if I got hold of it now and just did that, it would snap straight away. Yeah. And what you want is that elasticity to the bread. It's time-consuming, isn't it? It I is mean, one yeah. of those things that you can't rush. You can't yeah. go and just bang it in and Absolutely, off you go. Yeah. You've got to take time yeah. over it. I think you've definitely got to give it some love. There's nothing like a good bread, though. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Really oh, nice and warm with some you know, big chunk of butter on Butter on, on it, the smell. Stop up dribbling again. See, it's starting to come now. So you're getting that silkiness. Let's have a look at that texture now. It's sort of... It's starting to come. You see now, it's getting more of a drop on it, whether before it would just snap straight away. Do you have a finished one that we could, we could see texturally that's, that's sort of that's sort of yeah, there? Yeah, basically, what, what happens is, once this is ready to go in, we prove it. Now, the proving process will depend on how warm your area is. You want it between 30 and 40 degrees, and then basically just cover it. Oh. And you can see, when, you, when your dough's ready, it'll double in size. But you can see here where it's got lovely... I want pockets. to flick that. <laughs> oh, oh, that's just so much enjoyment. You see how much bread I was enjoying that. that bread boil. OK. Let's see the result of all this, this labour. Let's have a look at these let's beauties. Let's have a look. Mm. Mm, 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 so you mm. can basically see in there one that hasn't been proved, hasn't been kneaded enough, and this one's a perfect one. You see how tight it is? If you press it, it's very doughy. Yeah. And this one here, you know, is perfect. You see how it's springy, it's springing back. You start getting this aeration, that's what you want to see. And then this one here, if you don't want to do all the work and the yeast and everything, use the same ingredients, but just put some bicarb into it. I'm going to pass this over so you can see the texture there. Does, does that help, Simon? You can see, actually see in your hand the way that it, yeah, that's, it's supposed to be. If I could get, get close to this, I'd be happy. And... <laughs> time, time and intensity, I think Lisa's shown us, isn't she, basically? Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. If that's given you the baking bug, take note. White bread flour doesn't vary hugely, but whole wheat does. By quality, you'll taste the whole grain. The more water in the dough, the more open the crumb, as water helps the gluten become stretchy and hold more gas bubbles as the bread bakes. Dissolve dry or fresh yeast in water heated to 110 degrees. Be careful not to go hotter, as yeast cells die at 140. Ah, enough loafing around. Welcome back to the show which answers the important culinary questions. Questions like, what exactly is Gino De Campo saying? <laughs> right, now who'd like to ask one of our chefs something? What's your name? Sarah. Sarah, what's your question? I'm a student and I love to cook. Can you give me any tips on how to cook food for one on a budget? Right, Lisa. Cooking for one on a budget. So great food, not too heavy on the pounds. 
I think if you were going to look at the meat and poultry side of things, the uh, meats that take a lot longer to cook, and actually some of them are nicer than the prime cuts of meat. So you can go and get yourself a lovely beef cheek, uh, pop it in the oven, and then come back a couple of hours later and it's done. So I think it's about finding mm. those different things that you can... And also it's green, go to a greengrocer. I mean, if you yeah, buy stuff exactly, from a greengrocer, yeah. it's, it's half the price of a supermarket. You go to the markets, you can pick up some leeks and potatoes for a quid or something like that, because a great soup to make, isn't it? Right. Um, and then I'd go something like mackerel. You know, it's, it's good for your skin and also it's very cheap fish. Um, so that, I think, would be fantastic. Another question. Hello there. Hi. Uh, my question is, with the way food trends are today, um, how do you evolve your menus over time? Jason, can yeah. you predict what the next gastronomic sensation is? Oh, gosh. I think as a chef, to evolve your menu, you've always just got to keep an eye on what everyone else is doing. Yeah. It's always got to be just good seasonal food. And in Britain, we're very lucky that we have very distinct seasons. You know, I have some restaurants in places like Singapore, Hong Kong. There's no seasons. It's hot or it rains, mm -hmm. you know? So it's very difficult to gauge how you change your menus. But here, our seasons change the menus for you. You know, come spring, asparagus starts to come through, elderflower, wild garlic, wild uh, trout, wild salmon will start to come. So it just does it for you, you know? Ooh, marvellous. Time for another brilliant film. So, while I watch Annie Hall, <laughs> here's a little thing about someone who's very much ahead of his own food curve. Listen up, because it's time to do some gastronomic zeitgeist surfing as we explore a trend in the fashionable world of food. This week, we're taking our cue from Paddington Bear. And no, I don't mean marmalade. For the last three years or so, foodies all over the globe have been getting super excited about a certain Latin American style of cooking. It's Peruvian cuisine. And as a trend, it's just getting bigger and bigger in Britain. So pass the Pisco Sours. Peruvian food is laid undiscovered for such a long time. It's fresh, it's healthy, it's zesty, and it's packed with flavours. The food is absolutely fantastic, colourful, bright, incredibly tasty. This year, for the very first time, a Peruvian restaurant in the UK has won a Michelin star. That restaurant is Lima in London. Hola. And the chef in charge is Virgilio Martinez. New order, one ceviche, sea bream, one octopus. Yes, yes, yes. People nowadays is looking for really unique experiences. It is very important to surprise people. Our philosophy is to bring ingredients that probably you, you haven't seen it before. Peruvian food is very diverse, thanks to the geography of the country. Corn and potatoes come from the mountains, exotic fruit and chilies from the jungle, and a huge array of fish and seafood from the coast. They're fantastic ingredients, and several of them star in a dish that's massively popular right now. Ceviche. Ceviche is a raw dish. That's why it's so healthy, it's very lean. Ceviche is a fish cooked not by heat, but by the acidity of fresh citrus juice. The most important thing is to have a really, really fresh fish. The citrusy mix that cooks the fish is known in Peru as tiger's milk. Tiger's milk is the marinade that we use to cold cook our ceviche, sort of quick pickle. So, some garlic. Onion. Cut it very roughly. Some ginger. This is a chili pepper from Peru. Fish, free means. Some ice cubes, some salt. Lime juice. The key ingredient to make tiger's milk is to use a nice lime juice. 60% of the flavor of the tiger's milk is coming from the lime, and it cooks the fish. The tiger's milk needs to be left for 10 minutes to infuse. After infusing, we have to strain. We're gonna marinate the fish. After five minutes, the fish is turning a little bit white. It means we are cooking the fish. You see how the color has changed. So now it's time to plate the ceviche. 
The cubes of sea bream ceviche go onto the plate with a squirt of tiger's milk mixed with yellow chilli paste. Little piles of crushed toasted corn, some micro leaves and red onion. And ay carumba, it's complete. There's a chance, a big chance, to see people in Britain uh, cooking ceviche at home and, and having ceviche as much as Peruvians do. There's a chance, maybe.